Hello, and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute Cancer Immunotherapy and You Patient Education Webinar Series. I'm your host, Dr. Arthur Brodsky, Associate Director of Scientific Content at the Cancer Research Institute. And during today's webinar, we'll be focusing on advances in immunotherapy clinical trials, putting patients first, with a leading immuno-oncologist, as well as a best-selling author and cancer veteran. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly thank the generous sponsors of this webinar series, Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as Alchemy's, BioCan RX, and Lilly Oncology. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's featured guests. First, we have Dr. Joshua Brody, the director of the Lymphoma Immunotherapy Program at the Tisch Cancer Institute, among other positions at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Brody is also a former CRI CLIP investigator and a current CRI Lloyd Gerald star. We are also very fortunate to be joined by best-selling author Stephanie Ganji, who was first diagnosed with breast cancer more than two decades ago and was recently treated with a novel immunotherapy combination in one of Dr. Brody's clinical trials. So welcome, you two. Thank you. Happy awesome. to be here. So Dr. Brody, I'd like to start with you. Uh, your clinical trial uses a therapeutic approach called in situ vaccination or ISV. And this trial actually evolved from your prior CRI funded CLIP research. So could you tell us how ISV works, especially compared to normal cancer vaccines? And what made you think that this therapy would be good for Stephanie's cancer? Arthur, those are good questions. Um, not very easy questions, but I think we can easily summarize the big picture idea uh, which is that you know, folks have heard of cancer immunotherapies. The ones they've heard of are really a couple of particular types, certainly the most widely utilized cancer immune therapies. Uh, they have names like checkpoint blockade or PD-1 blockade, and these are Nobel Prize winning, 2018 Nobel Prize winning uh, concepts that are now actually medicines that are used for many types of cancer, uh, lung cancer, melanoma, bladder cancer. Um, they they're used for some small subset of breast cancers, but, but not the most common types uh, and are a little bit effective there. Those checkpoint block blockade therapies are very elegant. Um, and the concept is that some of us may already have immune responses against our tumors, but they've been sort of inhibited or the brake pedals have been put on to prevent uh, those anti-cancer immune cells from working well. So the concept of checkpoint blockade is just to cut the brake pedals, release those anti-tumor immune cells so they can do the job they were already trying to do. Very elegant concept, somewhat helpful for many tumor types, again, lung cancer, melanoma, a few others, uh, but still not helping the majority of patients with cancer. So just that concept of you know, cutting the brake pedal and letting the immune system do what it wanted to do, uh, still not good enough for many of our patients. So we have these other concepts and this concept of cancer vaccines is uh, an even older concept. Uh, it hasn't had the you know, recent success of checkpoint blockade. These are not standard therapies. Uh, there are really, for most cancers, no FDA approved therapeutic cancer vaccines. I gotta make one little quick distinction here. Sometimes when we say vaccine, people think about all the vaccines we know of, COVID vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, polio vaccine, they are all preventative vaccines. Uh, and that is how most of our vaccines are. But a vaccine doesn't have to be preventative. It can not just prevent problems, it can also treat problems that are already there, even though that's not how we use it for COVID and polio and so forth. So all these cancer vaccines that we're talking about mostly are not preventative vaccines, but therapeutic vaccines. So then what is a vaccine if it's not a preventative? A vaccine is just anything that specifically teaches your immune system, this thing is bad. It could teach it that about COVID. It's hard to use it, you know, if you already have COVID. But we have other uh, infections like tuberculosis where people are trying to make therapeutic uh, uh, tuberculosis vaccines or malaria vaccines. So that's the same concept here for cancer vaccines, trying to teach your immune system. This is what this patient's cancer looks like. Please go find it wherever it is uh, and get rid of it. So that's the broad concept conceptually not different from COVID vaccine, polio vaccine, just instead of saying, this is what COVID looks like, get rid of it. And saying, this is what this patient's cancer looks like, please go and get rid of it. And the immune system conceptually has the power to do that. You know, really the limitation has been, we are not good enough to do the teaching yet. You know, we don't, we haven't made yet powerful enough vaccines to teach the immune system what we wanted to learn. And also the other real trick there is that a little easier to make a flu vaccine or COVID vaccine than a cancer vaccine, because COVID, flu, these are viruses. They look very different than us. So easy to, for the immune system to find differences. Our cancers 
look very similar to us. They just have a few little differences compared to all the other cells in our body. So a little harder to make a precise vaccine that can pull out those littler differences. Still, there are some differences. Um, those differences, sometimes we call them mutations uh, from the immune system's perspective. They could be antigens or just broadly, we'll call them tumor markers. So this concept of cancer vaccines just teaching the immune system. These are the specific tumor markers that are present on the tumor, but not present on the rest of the person. Can you please go and find them? Bunch of different clinical trials uh, for many years working on trying to make these better. This broad concept here we have in this schema is that sometimes we can actually find out what are in a, per in a specific person, a personalized approach, what are the markers on that person's cancer that make the cancer different than every other cell. We could isolate and identify those markers, we call them antigens, and inject them into the person. And then the critical thing is those um, cancer antigens, cancer markers uh, have to get taken up by this magical immune cell we call the dendritic cell. We call it magical because it also won a Nobel Prize. The 2011 Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of these important uh, dendritic cells. And we say that they are magical and worthy of a Nobel Prize because they are really the generals of the immune army. Probably a lot of folks have heard of T cells. Uh, we hear about antibodies from our COVID vaccination. We get anti-COVID antibodies. And we also maybe get some anti-COVID you know, COVID T cells. Uh, but T cells are the important critical soldiers for fighting cancer in the immune army. But they get their orders from a very specific and rare subset of immune cells called dendritic cells. So these guys are the generals of the immune army. If you can tell them what to recognize, they will then instruct the T cells go after uh, those tumor markers wherever you can find them. So that's the broad concept of cancer vaccines. What we have been working on here at Mount Sinai, and we were very lucky to, uh, to get to study with uh, Stephanie and some of the other patients uh, on this trial, was a, a slightly simpler approach, really. It's that we can't always figure out what those tumor markers are, those cancer antigens. It's not very easy. Not only that, it's extremely sort of time consuming. One way this is done is you take a biopsy from the patient and can spend many months figuring out uh, in the lab what those tumor markers are. And then not, you know, not only have to figure them out, then you have to make them uh, reproduce those uh, the peptides or proteins or markers and then inject them to the patient. And as I say, that can take a long time. Uh, patients don't always have a long time uh, because during all that work, cancer could be growing in the person. So we've taken a different approach and broadly speaking, and I'll actually uh, give you a very specific example for Stephanie, uh, that approach is that we treat one site. So usually our patients have disease in multiple sites, metastatic cancer, and we treat one side of that disease with this, we call it off the shelf vaccine. And because we're really making the vaccine at the tumor site, we call this in situ vaccination. But the big idea is that we release some of those tumor markers get dendritic cells to take up those tumor markers right there at the tumor site, and then teach that to the rest of the immune system. Um, really, we only know if this is working if we treat one site and see distant sites all around the body melting away. So this in situ vaccine is you know, really more off the shelf. We don't have to make the product for everyone in the lab. We are making the vaccine literally at this tumor site. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to have some good success uh, with a few patients with breast cancer, with lymphoma, uh, and we can give some examples of those. Yeah, I thought that was a really good overview of the vaccines. Yeah. And I thought you made an, an important distinction as well, uh, you know, because in, most people think of them in the preventative context. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, when you say vaccine, cancer. people think, wait, what if I already have cancer? It's too late. No, no, no. Vaccine doesn't mean preventative. That's just always sort of assumed. Uh, and that's why we do have these other examples of therapeutic vaccines, tuberculosis, a couple of others. Yeah. And now, Stephanie, I would like to invite you to share your story uh, and what ultimately led you to Dr. Brody and convinced you to enroll in his immunotherapy clinical trial? Sure. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. First of all, thank you again, Dr. Brody. Every time I hear you talk, I learn something about what's been going on in my own body for a very long time. I was first diagnosed with breast cancer in 1999. And so in a way, I have my trajectory as a cancer patient has followed the trajectory of pr progress in cancer treatment because there's always been the next thing for me to try. And, and I've been lucky enough to have a, a wonderful team at Mount Sinai that has pushed me to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I have been the poster child for chronic breast cancer. And that is something that didn't even exist 
certainly when I was a very young woman, my I remember my mother and her sisters would whisper the cancer word. And so now it's chronic illness. And so I'm very lucky to have, uh, as I said, followed the trajectory of uh, medical science. So um, I was diagnosed in 1999 and have had uh, many subsequent treatments, including chemotherapy two or three times, oral chemotherapies, radiation surgeries, you name it, I've done it. And um, luckily, each of those instances and ev events of cancer and instances of treatment have helped me by 18 months, by two years. And then I would start to progress again. So that all led me to metastatic breast cancer in 2014. I uh, It was a very serious diagnosis. My cancer was always sort of localized in a weird way, but it had progressed to the chest wall. And so everyone was all excited and nervous about that, including me and my family. Um, and yet I was treated again with chemotherapy and bought some more time. And the time I bought, I think in the background, Dr. Brody and his team and all the doctors and researchers like him were figuring out a way to get me yet another step along the way. And so when I progressed in, I don't, Dr. Brody knows my stats way better than I do, but when I progressed in 2020, went from metastatic, almost localized to the adrenal gland, that was, um, not only was it scary, it was, it seemed like we, I was in the next level. Uh, it had progressed to an organ. It was not localized anymore. It was a whole different ballgame. But having said that, and having, you know, sung the praises of the slash burn poison regimen, slash meaning surgery, burn meaning um, radiation, poison meaning chemo, you know, I have sung those praises and it's kept me going. But at this point, when I progressed last year, I thought maybe I'm going to take a break. Major chemo was on deck again. That would have been my third time, hair loss, the whole bit. And my doctor at Mount Sinai at Dubin Breast Center was extremely unhappy when I said that. <laughs> and she said, let me look around and see if we can find a clinical trial that might be right for you. And it came up very quickly. I think that occurred around this time last year uh, that I the progression was such that chemo was on deck again. So by the very first week of January, I was in the clinical trial and it was, I'm not gonna lie, it was tough. It was, it went from January to July and there were a few times I wanted to quit. And then of course, when I saw my <laughs> baseline scans compared to my three month later scans, I was, absolutely astonished. I don't, I hadn't for all these years gotten a lot of good medical news. And I, I have to say that even as I sit here today, I'm still almost trying to wrap my head around it. I had another scan last week and that was even a little tiny bit, maybe better. And so it's been so many years of managing the psychic toll and the financial toll and the physical toll since 1999, 20 plus years. So that has shaped my life, of course. So now to kind of release it is another, um, it's another little hat trick I have to pull out. <laughs> and uh, I'm feeling this second scan is ma making me feel very, very good. So, I mean, ask questions. I'm happy to reveal as much as you'd like me to. I mean, my journey has been kind of incredible. I, I just have to say a couple of things about that journey that Stephanie describes, which is it's true for a, a lot of cancers, not all of them, but in those, especially like breast cancer and, and also lymphoma, which is one that, that, that I focus on, we've been very lucky to, as she kind of said, kind of ride the wave of therapeutic advances because, you know, if those... 20 years had been from 1960 to 1980, the advances would have been small. We're very unlucky to have cancer, very lucky to have cancer in this particular era instead of yeah. all the other times you could have had it. 
um, because as she as she hinted, she has gotten some benefit from other events just as they came. And that's been true for a lot of our patients. We literally have patients where we say one year, there is nothing left for you. However, there is something new that's coming in about a month. So if we can just get you, you know, safely yeah. and healthily through up until then, then we'll get, and we have patients who keep riding that wave yeah. uh, when they get the new thing comes out, they get it. And then, you know, best case would be if it cures them, but let's not oversell all of this stuff. So a lot of times we have discoveries that are not a cure, but if it can make you live, you know, happily and healthily and well for, you know, X months or years, you know, that's something. Yeah. So that Stephanie's been very lucky to, to be at the right time in the right place, because if we were all born in some other country, maybe we wouldn't have these opportunities. Um, yeah, so there's bad luck, but also some good luck wrapped in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's a good point too. You know, it's kind of a, you gotta, gotta balance the, the hope for the future and also, you know, be realistic. You don't want, like you said, you don't want to overpromise, but but it is a very exciting time with a lot of advances going on. Well, that um, hope thing that you mentioned is also critical because uh, knowing that trajectory uh, has ha it's not just a crazy rose colored glasses thing. It's a real thing. We have seen these events, not for every cancer. I, I can, we don't want to oversell this, but for some of them, breast cancer included, lymphoma included, some others, um, because that precedent of progress is there, it's not crazy to say, yes, here's where we are today, but I'm telling you, we will be someplace else next year. I mean, if we had no precedent of that, that would be crazy to say, but we have, we have this precedent of this progress. It's, it's not, it's not just an idea. It's not optimism. It's just practicality of looking at the progress over the last few years. So that is, is a little bit helpful with hope. Uh, Cause as Stephanie will tell you, I think on the journey, you know, the physical journey is a big thing and the emotional journey is may, probably even bigger. Um, you know, when she mentioned that this going from the chest wall to this adrenal gland, that's already an emotional thing because it's a little bit the unknown because most folks don't have much of a sense of what's my adrenal, where's my adrenal, I, you know, I never, yeah. I've heard of my, I never thought about where that is. And so the unknown is always much scarier, you know, a thing you can't see is unknown and it's just by definition, therefore scary. And that's a, a very rough part of the, the emotion. Absolutely. Journey. And Stephanie, I know you were, this, that was the first time that you received immunotherapy, uh, but I guess, could you speak to, you know, the, the points Dr. Brody mentioned did, or at least from your perspective, did you, how did you feel about, or, or were you even aware of this sense of, of the progress going on in the background that might, you know, benefit you? My, my oncologist had always talked about possibilities in the future. And, it, you know, when we get to this point, we'll take a look and see. And then we were at that point. And I have to say that I was not as aware, certainly, obviously not as aware as I am now. And I didn't realize I didn't know how to access, you know, it's kind of a, I want to be honest, it's a combination of things. On one hand, I wasn't exactly sure how to access. On the other hand, this has been my life and I'm not submerging myself in every detail of every possible thing that's coming down the pike. I'm trying to just be normal in a sense. And so I'm lucky enough to be able to rely on my my team at uh, Mount Sinai was fa fantastic, including my uh, immunotherapy team. Um, and, you know, I'm always, feel, I'm very lucky to be where I am and, you know, a place that is doing the research and uh, getting the funding and reaching me because I don't know that I had enough, um, I don't know, I'm not going to say motivation because it was my life, but I didn't know how to find immunotherapy trials or clinical trials. And I didn't really know how to ask for it until my doctor brought it to me. So I'm you know, actually sitting here today so that we can flip that script a little bit and patients are, uh, you know, actively seeking immunotherapy trials that can help them the way I have been helped in an astonishing way. I mean, I can't overstate how crazy it is to be me right now. <laughs> And Steph, let me just say there's a little balance there where it's critical for patients to advocate for themselves, but you can't spend your whole life you yeah, know, sitting on the exactly. internet because the whole purpose of this is so that you have a life to do those other things. And I, I, I hope I'm allowed to plug this. Steph has spent her life productively and busily being a novelist, as Arthur said, and I read one of her novels. Am I allowed to plug which one I read? Sure. I read one of her novels, Carry the Dog, uh, which was great. And if she was busy researching cancer all day, she would not. 
<laughs> we did not plan that. That was just no, organic. No, because I'm doing um, a bunch of interviews today, so I had to have it nearby. Always good to have. So, you know, if she had spent all of her life, you know, just researching cancer, she would not have been able to do live her life, do these things, write that book uh, and others. Uh, and yet there's still a balance because it is still important to be somewhat an advocate for oneself. The best way to be an advocate is just to have a doctor that you trust. Um, it's tricky because it's like having a car mechanic. And if you don't know a lot about the inside of engines, how can you trust? Yeah. You don't know, right? Uh, but you'd have to, just like with any relationship, have some doctor that you trust. To be fair, a lot of patients can have two doctors. They can have sometimes because they live far away from the academic center, their local doctor, and then four hours away is the academic center, and they see their local doctor all the time, and they see the academic person that may have access to uh, promising trials, you know, see them once or twice a year as needed, or whenever the community doctor says, oh, you know what, maybe go back to see that academic again. Um, so that's another business model and probably a good one, but either way to have one that you trust, so you trust that they are spending their time searching out uh, the most promising trials, but there's still a bit of, bit of both because, uh, you know, there is no one right answer for a lot of patients. So for patients to be advocating a bit, pushing a little bit saying, well, are there, can you just tell me a little bit about other options? You can't list A through Z of the options, but can you tell me a little bit about other options, immunotherapies, promising trials and so forth. Yeah. So some balance so, of advocacy, yeah. And that, this is such an important topic, uh, uh, you know, the patient doctor relationship and being able to have that open line of communication. And I definitely wanna get back to that. First though, uh, Dr. Brody, I was hoping you could just say a little bit more, um, you know, about how this, how the ISV treatment actually helps Stephanie. Um, and then also, could you, just, you know, you've, we've mentioned breast cancer and lymphoma specifically so far, uh, but could you could you speak to ISV's potential effectiveness in other cancers, as well as, you know, what might need to be done to expand its effect, its benefits to more patients? Sure, absolutely. Wow, there's a, a few in there. So let me try to answer that first and most important one, which is, you know, what is this ISV and specifically how has it helped Stephanie? So uh, I showed a little bit of this picture. This is actually a scan uh, and Stephanie's given us permission to share uh, some of this information. So this is a scan uh, really across uh, Stephanie's chest kind of looking sideways. So you can see this is her heart, uh, the different chambers of her heart. This is uh, the back of her lungs. Uh, black is full of air. You can see her back, her chest and the sternum, the bone of your chest bone. Um, and in Stephanie's case, as she said, she had cancer uh, throughout the chest wall. So here was one side of cancer here. I know it's not easy to see, but I'll make it easier in a second. Uh, and here was another site of cancer. So one sort of below and one above. This is from almost a year ago now, January of, of earlier this year. And this ISV, this in situ vaccine, again, making the vaccine not in a lab, not at a company, but making the vaccine in the person. I have to give the one quick metaphor here, which is that uh, many folks in the audience are too young to remember this, but this is the, we say, the Benihana of cancer vaccines. Benihana doesn't make your food. They bring out the ingredients and they make it there at the site. That is in situ yeah. Japanese barbecue, and this is in situ <laughs> cancer vaccination, making them uh, these vaccines for each person at the site. So as you sort of see schematized here, there are three ingredients to this vaccine. I won't go into too much detail, but really it's one ingredient, it's called FLITRIEL, to bring immune cells to that cancer site. The second ingredient is local low-dose radiation therapy. So radiation therapy, as Stephanie said, can be tough. This is actually a pretty low dose, so usually a lot better tolerated than, than normal radiation therapy, but it still uh, can have side effects. Uh, and then the third ingredient, this is actually the one that, that actually gives patients some side effects, the main side effect of having a fever not unlike the COVID vaccine that gave you a fever for a day, pretty similar to that, I would say. So bringing immune cells, irradiating the tumor a little bit to release some of those tumor markers that these immune cells can eat up and present to the rest of the immune army. And then this third, it's literally a virus-like uh, chemical. The immune system sees it like a virus, um, even though it's just a chemical and not a virus that activates those immune cells. So these three ingredients, um, and uh, we again administer them at the tumor site. So this was the actual tumor site that we did these local injections are, uh, for Stephanie. And this is actually a picture of the low dose radiation therapy that she got sort of concurrent with uh, the in situ vaccine. So that radiation therapy was just two days of radiation therapy. Other folks that have heard of radiation know it can go on for 18 days or 30 days. So you can kind of hear that two days is a, it's just a lower dose and therefore a bit gentler. Um, and you can actually see the boundaries of the radiation that was administered. This is all, almost all the radiation going to this one tumor site, but you see a little bit of the radiation went just beyond there, but really none beyond that. 
So we treated this one site uh, where there was metastatic breast cancer. And one of the easy things you can see right away, that was in January of earlier this year, already by March of that year, not only is that site getting better, but it's a little easier to see that site that's really kind of far away from the treated site is also melting. You saw there was a big uh, mass of cancer there and it's already going away. I can actually make that one a bit easier to see when we look at it instead of sideways looking at when we look at it transversely. So these are both lungs, this is the heart, and this is that top uh, tumor site. Oh, excuse me, I'm gonna go backwards one. And that top tumor site is on a PET scan very bright because it takes up a lot of sugar. This is how we use PET scans to delineate cancer a bit more clearly. So that uh, tumor site that was far away from the treated site prior to the vaccine. And then after the vaccine, you can see almost completely melting away. And that's pretty gratifying. But in, in this case, there's actually one spot that was even further away that tells the story even better. And Stephanie referred to this. She said when the cancer went from her chest wall to become metastatic to her adrenal gland. And this is a picture of that. This is that same transverse scan cut across the middle of the abdomen now. This is the liver. This is the back, the belly, just above the belly button right here. And this is the left adrenal gland just above the left kidney. And you see a big glowing mass here because this is a PET scan. That tumor eats up a lot of sugar uh, and that's what's glowing here. And this was that mass uh, a little more than a year ago, March, 2021. And as Steph said, she was treated with a type of chemotherapy, a very standard one called doxyl uh, or liposomal uh, doxorubicin. And that chemotherapy, uh, like she said, is a poison and can have some tough side effects. And in this case, those side effects weren't really paid off because that mass did not get any smaller. A few months later, that mass was actually getting a bit bigger. So not great efficacy of that chemotherapy. And as Steph said, she got another chemotherapy after that. This one's called capecitabine or Zolota. This is a pill, an oral chemotherapy. And from July until later uh, that year, uh, not a lot of benefit either. You see that mass is still quite large. And these tumors, we sometimes take them out and count the cells them. This is about 10 or 15 billion cancer cells. So it's a lot of cancer. I hate to say something a bit gross, but this is a lemon-sized tumor. Uh, so we don't wanna put people off of fruits, but this is a, not a small thing. This is when uh, Steph talked to her doctor, Dr. Yoko Iri, who is a brilliant physician scientist here as well, and always kind of has her ears up for latest progress in clinical trials. Um, and she referred to Steph for the study. This was January, right before the vaccine. And then after the vaccine, you do not need to be a radiologist to see this difference. Uh, everyone can see this. You can see that giant tumor basically melting away. And we don't want to oversell. We don't want to state that it is 100% gone. But it, with your eyeball, you can see this has got to be more than 99% gone because it's basically invisible at this point. And again, that's this immune system, Stephanie's immune system, killing 10 billion, 15 billion cancer cells uh, in the course of a couple of months. And as Steph said, she actually had a repeat scan. Uh, I won't show it because it looks mostly similar to this result here. Um, in fact, maybe a little bit even better. Uh, but here she is, you know, six months after this scan uh, and still in this remission, which was, again, her own immune system getting rid of cancer cells. So very gratifying. Um, uh, some proof of concept that the immune system can get rid of cancer. Some proof of concept that this way of teaching the immune system uh, can be effective, even for patients for whom standard chemotherapies have been ineffective. So pretty gratifying for us, and I, I think very gratifying for Steph. Yeah, I think it's it's great to see that. Um, but you know, more important than seeing the scans and the the data, you know, it's not for publications or applications. The the proof is you know seeing Stephanie here happy and healthy, which is you know the, the most important thing. Absolutely. Um, and so now I, I do want to turn back to uh, you know the doctor patient relationship, and both of you you know, have, have such experience on, on both sides of the issue, which I, I think would be very valuable. So Stephanie, I want to start with you, you know, with everything you've been through and all the different doctors and treatments and experience you have, what, what kind of advice would you give to a patient? You know, you kind of referenced this stuff earlier about how much you're aware of and, and asking um, your doctor about potential options and whatnot. And obviously every patient is different, but I guess what, what kind of advice would, knowing what you know now, would you give to somebody who is newly diagnosed with cancer about how they should you know, approach conversations with their oncologist? Well, I'm always shy about giving advice, especially on the topic of cancer. It's so personal and uh, healthcare is so personal. But um, I mean, I was always advocating for myself, 
again, I had a team that was looking closely at me all the time. I paid attention to what they were telling me to do and what the how to manage side effects. And I did all that. And I also tried to, again, compartmentalize a little bit and not center my illness and my treatment and the doctor visits, which have been many, 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 and sort of, you know, make sure that I was centering my regular normal life. And so I brought that to Dr. Appointments. I, uh, Dr. Irie, um, mentioned by Dr. Brody, Dr. Irie and I, I mean, I have uh, acknowledged her in both books because Dr. Irie, I would walk in and the first thing she would do is say, let me look at you, like, look at me, you know, let me see your energy. And to know that I had a doctor who was understanding that I was coming in from a whole life that I was living into this office to do this thing that was scary and big. Uh, and her uh, empathy and uh, also research chops gave me great confidence so that it, now this maybe is a little bit under the advice column. I was not afraid to ask questions. I wasn't discouraged from going home and Googling. Of course, that's a whole other topic, but um, I was I was encouraged to do my own research as far as I could. And so I figured out how to manage that and not take on too much and ask her questions. I think I was lucky enough that I had a doctor and team, not only um, Dr. Irie, that was answering my questions when I was, you know, typing them in and emailing off. And I, I just felt fully supported. And as I, I, I sometimes refer to myself as a professional patient because I have been through every kind of office and experience and form filling out. I mean, there's so much more than just sitting in the doctor's office with the gown on. There's a whole thing that happens and you have to really kind of steal yourself to that. And actually, I'm going to tell the story. I hope it doesn't make me sound um, weird. But in the immunotherapy trial, one of the physician's assistants, very competent, wonderful nurse, um, said to me one day, Miss Ganji, you almost have a force field around you. Meaning I was very present for my own treatment. I understood what was happening. I questioned something if it didn't feel right or seem right, or it was different than the last time. It, so I, all the after all these years, I think that the teams I met, and again, so lucky, gave me the confidence to ask questions and speak up. And I think if you don't feel you're getting that from your team, that you can be an active, engaged participant, you need to either conquer that fear or hesitation or find a new team. This makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, and so, Dr. Brady, now I want to turn to you. Um, and, I, and I guess first, I think I would say, you know, it is, there are the benefits, as you mentioned, to becoming more involved in your care uh, and kind of educating yourself. But again, it's, you know, a lot of people are overwhelmed and this, this could be a very, uh, cancer itself is very intimidating. As you've mentioned uh, before, sure. the doctor world, uh, I think you, you said some people kind of just want to submit the doctors are the experts. Um, so I guess, Dr. Brody, from your perspective, though, um, you know, even if there is a patient who's overwhelmed, you know, obviously, we're not, no one would ever be asked or even, you know, encouraged to do something if they, if they don't want to. But I guess, could you speak a little bit more from from your perspective of the benefits and maybe some some easy or you know, initial steps that someone might be able to take, especially, you know, as Stephanie mentioned, the fear of it, um, how, how, what steps might someone be able to take to start overcoming that and, and help kind of growing that rapport, even if it's just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, Arthur, you kind of hinted at a key word there, which is rapport. Um, and Stephanie uh, pointed out that, you know, you don't have a choice of every doctor in the world because you live in one place and you have access to these doctors. But, you know, we're very lucky, many of us to have some choices, um, thankfully, Medicine is evolving in, you know, in some good ways, not in every which way. And, uh, and, and we hopefully have some choices still. Um, let me say this, that uh, yeah, there is a, a whole social construct and, uh, and people would have some concern 
uh, you know, I want, I don't want to offend my doctor. I don't want, you know, they have uh, egos and pride and all that stuff. Yeah, it's true. They do. Uh, doctors are people and, and people have all of these things and maybe doctors even more than other people, uh, bigger egos and all of that. It's, it's all probably true, but come on, there's a limitation to that. No doctor ever, ever, ever would be upset by a patient saying, um, uh, let's just want to get a second opinion and, and see. I mean, that would be crazy. I'm not saying no doctor would ever get upset, but they certainly should never express that. And if they really did get upset, that's probably actually not the right doctor for you. We have our patients get second opinions. I mean, we're in New York City. We have a lot of amazing hospitals in New York City. We have patients say, I'd like a second opinion. And I say, great. I can either point you to some people or, you know, you can go search them out either way. Sometimes we're afraid if we point them to people, we'll only send them to our friends and then they'll hear the same thing twice. Um, but people in important critical times should be getting second decisions. There are a couple of rare exceptions. There are some emergency time is of the essence things where there's just no time. You know, if someone's having a heart attack, you don't get a third and fourth opinion. You have to treat that right now. But most, most, most situations, uh, they're reasonable to get second and third, second and third opinions. And then beyond that, it's too much. You're, you're, yeah. If you're looking for your fourth opinion, no, no, no. Okay, you got three, three is plenty. Um, so a doctor should not get upset about that. If any doctor was not helpful or conducive to that, then that's already a bit of a red flag. Uh, and, uh, and, and amongst those doctors, like you said, Arthur, you, there should be some, some rapport. Rapport does not happen instantly, but there should be some, you know, some, some early semblance of it and some development of it over time. And then if there's that, then you, know, you shouldn't be afraid to, to ask questions. Um, you, here's, the, here's the critical thing. You should not be afraid to ask dumb questions. People say, oh, here's a dumb, well, all questions are dumb questions until you find, oh, it actually turns out that dumb question was a brilliant question. So you should not be afraid to ask dumb questions. Um, uh, and if you are, you know what, to some degree, confront that fear a little bit and just, just do it anyway. Um, yeah, and those things build rapport. Uh, and if your doctor can't give you straightforward-ish English answers, you know, to your question or in whatever your native language is, meaning not just doctor science answers, but something that you get the answer, then, you know, you probably should be getting more opinions as well. And a lot of our patients, uh, you know, don't just have one doctor, they may have a local community doctor because they live four hours away from the city. And then maybe, you know, a doctor at the academic institution in the city or wherever, and they see the community local doctor frequently and see that sort of academic doctor that knows maybe more about trials or something, see them, you know, either as needed or, you know, just a couple times a year. Uh, that's a, a pretty good approach as well. So they can have second opinions frequently um, by having two doctors uh, in the loop. Thank you both so much for sharing those insights. Uh, so we're almost out of time, but before we go, I wanted uh, to give both of you a chance, uh, since the webinar is about clinical trials, uh, to talk about what you've, first, I'll start with you, Stephanie, what you have learned uh, and what you would want other patients, what you think it would be good for other patients to know about clinical trials. I mean, it, the glaring headline of what I learned is that I learned that they can actually <laughs> clear tumors. It was a phrase I hadn't ever heard and certainly didn't think was possible for me. I thought I, I, I thought immunotherapy was something that was sciencey and futury and maybe not uh, couldn't apply to me. So uh, I, I learned that it's very much uh, therapy that is happening right now, right today and to me and that Cancer is not, um, I was about to say a death sentence, but I think I, I'd already known that, but it's not only um, gonna go one way, that there it fluctuates, it, it moves, it's changing, it does adapt to you know, the inside of me and figures out the inside of me. And I didn't really realize that until the immunotherapy. I didn't know that my own body could do the work. I thought it was only external. Um, I just dropped a ring, sorry. Um, and so what I would say is keep asking and pushing and uh, certainly have hope. I mean, I never didn't have hope. Since 1999, I've always expected that there would be a way. And I think that sometimes that was delusional and yet it helped me manage through. So um, just keep pushing. I know that sounds simplistic and maybe a little bit reductive, but uh, that is what my strategy was. And it seems here I sit today. 
Very happy for that. Yeah, me too. Arthur, I just have to agree with that, that maybe key phrase, keep pushing. Uh, and it's all kinds of pushing. It's, you know, pushing yourself not to feel despair uh, and, and pushing yourself to still have some hope, you know, delusional hope, real hope, uh, somewhere in between. Uh, the pushing is critical. But then, as I hinted, there's that pushing on your medical team, not pushing uh, too much, but pushing gently. Um, you know, we're New Yorkers, so we're naturally pretty pushy um, and maybe more open to it, but people all over should be allowed to push their medical team a little bit. And what that means is, okay, I hear you. That's your recommendation. I got you. Just give me a little hint. Are there other options? Um, uh, and if they say, you know, yes, there are, but here's why. Okay, at least you heard something about them. You don't have to hear all 10 options, but it's okay to hear a, a bit about the few options. You know, just tell me a little bit about plan B. Just tell me a little bit about plan C, just so I have some knowledge of it. Maybe I'll Google it a little bit. I won't spend my life Googling it, but I could just know a little bit about it because we don't want the future to be an unknown and a boogeyman in a closet. Once you click and type plan B and plan C a little bit, okay, I get it. That's the future maybe. Okay, right. a little less scary. But really there is this unfortunate thing where for the last you know, many decades, clinical trials are considered a, a last ditch effort, a, a plan yeah. Z of last resort. Oh my goodness, that is a huge disservice to, to patients. And the reason that evolved is very natural. Uh, docs, just like everyone, have their comfort zone. If here's plan A, B, C, I've been using that one for years, comfortable with it, I know how it works. And, and clinical trials always have some unknown component to them. But uh, every miraculous breakthrough, and I don't think you cannot describe Stephanie's awesome ability to clear her own cancer as miraculous. If, you, if that's not a miracle, you know, I'm not sure what is. Um, every miraculous breakthrough uh, has come from clinical trials. So, I mean, you want to get access to those or you don't. It's not that every clinical trial is great, um, but your doctor has an ability and some knowledge to tell you, oh, this one actually seems pretty promising and most importantly, you know, reasonably safe. Um, so I think that would be a good, you know, cost benefit to go and at least hear about this trial. You don't have to commit to it just by hearing about it, um, but it you know would be a great service to all of our patients, and that's the purpose of this today is to you know encourage patients to push a little bit. Are there promising clinical trials for me in this situation now? Because some of those trials might be more promising now than they would be you know as a last last ditch effort when, when other things have all failed. Uh, so yeah, I think that would be uh, great advice for me and probably from Steph too. It's too important to be to miss out over being timid. Yeah. Yeah, I, just to add one quickly, one quick thing. I mean, I knew that I was not comfortable facing another full-on chemo, and I, I, in the past, I always just, of course, did what I was told and did what you know traditional medicine was telling me to do, and that was the right thing to do. But at this point, I was older and I was not looking forward to another, you know, year or 18 months of my life being hijacked and being sick again. Uh, so when Dr. Brady talks about pushing and I talk about pushing, I also pushed myself to say, I'm not sure I can do it again. So. You must, must take incredible courage, right? Well, or, or crazy. <laughs> A little crazy. I'm very thankful that both of you shared your perspectives with us today. I uh, hope, hope our audience finds it very informative and enlightening as well. Thank you so much, both of you again. For more of our educational content and webinars and other resources that we have for patients and caregivers, we encourage you to check out our website at cancerresearch.org slash patients. Here, you'll be able to read and watch stories shared by others who have received immunotherapy across a wide variety of cancer types. You'll be able to browse our entire library of past webinars and Immunotherapy Patient Summit series featuring the world's leading immunotherapy experts. You'll be able to access information on other resources, including treatment, emo emotional support, and financial assistance. And you you'll also be able to have uh, help finding an immunotherapy clinical trial through our clinical trial finder. One last time, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as Alchemy's BioCan RX and Lily Oncology for making this webinar series possible. Uh, and thank you all for your attention today. I hope you found the experiences that they've shared and information they shared very helpful. Um, and if you want to check out any of our other webinars, you can find them at cancerresearch.org slash webinars to learn more about immunotherapy for a number of cancers. Uh, and then finally, Dr. Brody and Stephanie, thank you both again so much for taking the time to help out, help us out today. Thanks, doctors.